How's it going everybody? My name's Dave Whipple and you're watching Bush Radical. Well here we are guys, we finally made it to 2020. And in this video, I'd like to share with you guys my opinion anyway of what would be 20 radical tips for 2020. Stay tuned. Number 20, kit out your rig. That means whatever you're driving, you've got ideas of things you'd like to do. Is your vehicle set up for it? In Alaska, I've got three pickup trucks. They've all got tow hitches on them. One's a four wheel drive, goes wherever you want. The other one's a two wheel drive, but I keep a set of chains on it. But 99% of the time I'm driving my old car because it's so cheap and so easy to get around with. But the car is worthless for carrying a canoe and the headlights stink. So what I did last year is I built this nice solid two by four rack on the top. It's just two by fours with U-bolts. I've got solid one by hardwood boards that are screwed down to it. Now what this has done for me is it's given me the ability to throw my canoe right on top of the car without running the risk of it falling off in traffic. Not only that, but I've also bolted a light bar onto that rack. So when I'm driving through Northern Canada and my headlights stink, I can just kick this baby on. Nothing's worse than being to the point where you're ready to do something, but you can't because you've put off getting your rig ready, however that may look. Number 19, don't forget your EDC. Now if you've watched this channel for three years and 175 videos, you have never heard me say the words EDC which stand for everyday carry. I don't think that way. Half the time I'm less prepared than I should be. I've never been in the military. Uh, so the whole EDC mentality is something uh, I don't really ever think about. But I do find that I've always got three things in my pocket. This is my EDC. I always have a Dunlap guitar pick. I always have a Bic lighter. Generally, I like the small one just because it uh, it's not as obtrusive in your pocket. And I always have a small pocket knife. I generally like the small blade on the small pocket knife. Is this the best EDC for everybody? Probably not. A lot of people like a Leatherman because it's got screwdrivers and a pair of pliers and it makes a ton of sense. But it's kind of heavy, it goes on your belt, and uh, even though I've got one and love it and use it all the time, I never carry it. But I've always got these three things. They go from one set of pants into the next, into the next. Most of you aren't gonna need the guitar pick, but there is always something that needs to get cut and you'll always find something that needs to be lit on fire. Number 18, drink more water. Does anybody ever get as much water as they should have? Probably not. Being dehydrated is the cause of a lot of different problems, so even though it's stupid simple, Make sure you drink your water. Number 17, change your oil. We live in a day and age where you can get behind the wheel of an efficient car that gets good mileage and go anywhere you want for not a whole lot of money. Having a good running, dependable car means freedom and mobility. It's something that's so easy to take for granted. There's really nothing that you can do for your car that's gonna go farther than making sure it's got clean oil in it. That was solid information when our grandpas gave it to us. And it's still good today. Number 16, buy a headlamp. And when I was growing up, the only folks that had headlamps were coon hunters. It was just a thing that was like a car battery on your hip and like a headlight of a car that sat on top of your head and they cost a ton of money and it, the whole outfit weighed like 11 pounds. But nowadays, with the LED headlamps, they're so cheap, they're so dependable, they last such a long time. Unlike a flashlight where you've always got it in your hand or in your mouth, which is even worse, with a headlamp, you've got two hands free. The audience that's watching this channel, I'm sure you guys already have a headlamp. But if you've got a family of four, get four headlamps. So everybody's got a headlamp. If you've got three vehicles, get a headlamp for each vehicle. I like to put mine on the gear shifter. So whenever I'm traveling and the car's full of gear, in the middle of the night if I need the headlamp, I know exactly where it's at every single time. Also at the house, we keep all of our headlamps hung up in one spot on a peg on a, on a piece of trim. So if the power goes out, you can always feel your way to where all the headlamps are and everybody in the family's got one. Of all the inventions in the 21st century, I would say the LED headlamp is pretty high on my list. It's been one of the most beneficial improvements in technology that I can think of. If you don't have one, make sure you go buy one. Get one for everybody in the family and every vehicle. Number 15, go through your outdoor gear. That means your guns, your ammunition, your fishing poles, your sleeping bags, your tents. In the middle of winter like this, it's a great time to sort through everything that we want to use in the spring and in the summer for outdoor recreation. Put new line on your fishing poles, sharpen your hooks, oil up your guns, find the ammo that's in every corner of your house and put it all in one spot so when you want it, 
and you're ready to go do something fun and entertaining in the outdoors, everything's ready to go. You know where it's all at. So you don't have to fix the tips on fishing poles or, or go to the store to buy a new line or find the plug for your boat that you lost the year before. Getting all our outdoor gear ready for when we need it. What a better way to use January. Number 14, focus on what you have. Let me tell you guys a story. Earlier this fall, Brooke and I did an estate sale for, for a, a member of the family that had passed away. It was a husband and wife. The husband passed away. The wife is in a nursing home. We went to their house and collected everything and put on a big estate sale. And the husband had like four chainsaws. And they had this little, you know, three acre place on the river. And all these saws combined maybe had ever cut a cord of wood. And all through the sale, I'm thinking, man, I, I, I should buy one of these saws. Maybe if they don't sell, maybe I'll make an offer on them. And I was just looking at these chainsaws, and they're, they're so new, and I, I knew they had no hours on them per se. And they all sold. So I sat around and hemmed and hawed and took money and talked to people, and I never did buy one of these saws. And I probably would have had one given to me if I asked for it. But honestly, I just wanted them because I knew they were quality. I, I understood the value of them. But I didn't need them. I have a steel 034 and two Echoes. And I love the Echoes. They need a little bit of dialing in, but they're great saws. And the steel 034, that's one of the best saws you could ever hope for. I've cut dozens and dozens of cords of wood with those saws. But I'm sitting there looking at these other saws like they're, you know, like they're something I, I need. And I don't need it. But what I did realize is that my own saws were just covered in sawdust and dirt and grease and, and I hadn't really taken care of them. So what I did, I went home, I got my saws out. I spent like four hours cleaning my chainsaws out, cleaning the air filters and blowing off all the debris and junk. I bought a brand new bar and chain for my steel. I cleaned up my Echo that's here, my other Echo's in Alaska. And by the time I was done, my saws looked just as good as the saws that were at the estate sale. And the reason I wanted the ones at the estate sale is because they obviously looked like they were in great shape. Well, mine were in great shape too, but they were just neglected by me. So the, the nugget of wisdom there is uh, focus on the stuff that you've got. A lot of times we just neglect the things that we have to the point where something else looks better. But uh, we should probably just go, uh, go through our own gear and, and take better care of the things we already own. That brings me to tip 13. Sharpen your knives. Now whether we're talking about kitchen knives or whether we're talking about hunting knives or pocket knives or fillet knives, whatever. Knives get dull if you use them. If you have a knife, it's because you want to use it to cut something. If you use it, it will get dull. That's just the way knives work. We're all guilty of not having our knives as sharp as they could be. And there's no such thing as a knife that's too sharp. What you want is you want a tool that does the job as good as it can when you need it to. And whether the job of that tool is slicing a tomato, gutting a fish, making a sandwich, doesn't really matter. What matters is that your knife is as sharp as it can be when you need it to be sharp. A knife's job is to cut stuff, so it can never be too sharp. Unless it's a putty knife or a butter knife or some other kind of knife that's not really a knife knife. A knife should cut as good as it possibly can. It makes the job easier, it makes it less work on the tool, less work on the user. Not only sharpen every knife that you've got, Go over to your sister's house and sharpen every knife that she's got. My sister's knives are so dull, you'd have a hard time putting your eye out with one. But when I really sit back and think about it, I've got plenty of knives that are just as bad. Get them all sharp. Keep them that way. Make everything you do with a knife better. Speaking of tools, that brings me to tip number 12. Get rid of the tools that you have that you don't use. I know that's counterintuitive. The thought is, the more tools you have, the more equipped you are for anything that could come down the line. Fact of the matter is, almost every one of us that likes to work with our hands has more tools than we're ever going to need. We also have tools that we're never going to use. Somebody else could get good use out of those tools. I probably have six framing hammers. You know, maybe there's a young kid just down the road that doesn't even have a framing hammer, just getting out of school, renting his first place, or buying his first place. Or maybe he doesn't have half the stuff I've got triplets of. And then there's always the tools that you're just never going to use. That collection of saw blades that you, you planned on sharpening, but you're, you're just never going to do it. Better to get that crap out of your garage so you can actually find the stuff 
you need when you need it. This is a problem I struggle with quite a bit. I got tools in this shop for pretty much anything I could want to do. Problem is, I'm not going to do some of that stuff, and those tools are always there when I'm looking for other things. They're always in the way. They're never going to be a benefit to me, but to probably be a benefit to somebody else. So tip number 12 for 2020, get rid of the tools that you don't need. Which makes everything else easier to find. Speaking of getting rid of things that we don't need or want anymore, that brings me to tip number 11. Clean out all the clothes that you don't wear anymore and just donate them. Now some things are valuable enough that you might want to eBay if you want to do that. If you just want the clutter out of your head and out of your house, I would donate them. You know, take this sweater for example. This is a wool Patagonia sweater. It's thick, it's heavy, it's super warm. The problem is I'm a little too fat for it. Used to fit okay, but it never fit great. But it was such good quality that when I saw it, I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna buy that. It's about my size and it's, it's inexpensive. It was from a thrift store. But the problem is I find that I never wear it. And when I do wear it, I don't really like it that much. And even though it's something I could eBay, I'm just gonna give it to the next person by dropping it off at a thrift store. Now, when I take stuff into thrift stores, one of the things I really wanna look for I always look for the thrift stores that sell stuff cheap because I don't want to take a $35 eBay deal, give it to a thrift store and have them sell it for $35 to the next person. I want to see it go for 2 or $3 to somebody who actually needs it, wants it, and can do something with it. Same thing with this vest. You know, Carhartt vests, always popular, always worth some money. This one is older and it's seen some time, but it's in fantastic shape. Problem is, is it's a little too short for me and I'm a little too fat for it. So I'm gonna donate this just to get it out of my head, out of my life and off the hooks in my closet. Number 10, pay more attention when you number your lists. By the time I got to editing this video, I realized I hadn't shot anything for number 10. Number nine, get out and get some fresh air. I live inside of a house. You probably live inside of a house. I've got pets, maybe you've got pets. Everybody's got dust. It's always good to get outside and get as much fresh air. I mean, I don't even know why I commented on this. What's wrong with fresh air, right? Number eight, buy stuff that lasts. Take a look at this. This is a 1960s Grumman canoe. I paid $125 for it. It's older than I am and it's in better shape than I am. When you look at any kind of manufactured goods, a lot of things have reached their peak and are either poorer quality than they used to be or they're just the same quality as their peak. When you look at this canoe, for example, if you bought a new Grumman canoe, it's gonna be made pretty much exactly the same way that this one was. This technology peaked 50, 60 years ago. You're not going to buy a better aluminum canoe, but you can spend 10 times as much money to get the same quality. When you take a look at a lot of the items that we buy, the technology may have peaked 50 years ago, and now we're on the downhill slope where people have settled for items that are lesser quality but do the same job. Handsaw is a great example. A 100-year-old distant handsaw is a better quality saw then you're gonna buy brand spanking new. Walk into a hardware store and buy a Stanley shark tooth saw. Once it's dull, you throw it away. Buy a hundred year old distant handsaw, you can sharpen and reset that saw a thousand times. It's gonna be good for the rest of your life. That technology peaked a hundred years ago. A lot of things that we could buy, we could get used and get a better deal and a better item. Just take a peek at my old wheel horse B80. This tractor is as old as I am. Every part of this machine is steel and cast iron. You can't go out and buy a new model that is as durable and heavy duty as this tractor. Stop into the John Deere dealership and all you're gonna see is plastic and aluminum. This thing is all iron. The engine's iron. The frame is iron. The rear end is iron. I'm gonna be able to hand this thing down to my son and it cost me a hundred dollars to get the best that has ever been made. A 50 year old canoe is every bit as good as anything you can find today. A 45 year old lawn tractor made by Wheel Horse is every bit as good as anything you could find today. And you can buy those things for pennies on the dollar. The canoe cost me 125. The same canoe, brand new, is a $1,600 canoe. And it's made exactly the same way that canoe was made in the 60s, because the technology has never improved. That brings me to number seven know where to get off the bus when it comes to technology. Right now I'm shooting on a Canon HG20 camera. 
it's as good as the updated version, which I don't own. I'm editing on a 2011 MacBook Pro. It does every single thing that I need it to do. It has never improved to where I said, oh, I, I've got to have that improvement. My 92 F-150 does everything that a brand new truck would do, and it cost me pennies on the dollar. One of the best pieces of advice I've ever got was don't trade a gun for a snow machine. And the whole thought behind that comment is a gun is always going to hold its value to some extent. A snow machine is always going to decrease in value. Why is that? Well, it's because the gun does one thing, and once you have dialed the quality of that item in, you're not really going to get it any better. Every single year, snow machines get lighter and faster and more efficient and et cetera, et cetera, and then it becomes a game of numbers. The same is true with compound bows. If you shoot bow every single year, bows get lighter, bows get faster, bows get this, this, and this. They also get more expensive. There's a point where every one of us has to decide where we're going to jump ship on technology and be happy with what's already there. I, I still have the same kind of compound bow my dad bought me back in like 1981. That bow shoots as good as I could shoot. You could go buy one exactly like mine today for $25. It has no resale value because that market is constantly competing. But I think for each one of us, you know, we have to know when to call it quits. Uh, my 1950s outboard motors are fantastic motors and I've paid like a hundred bucks a piece for them. If I was to go buy the equivalent in a brand new motor, I would probably have seven grand wrapped up into two engines and they're going to do the same thing my old engines do. But they're going to cost me a ton of money just to be up to date, just to have the latest and greatest. I just don't want to play that game. I've always been a guitar picker, and if you look at guitars, the great guitars haven't changed in 70 years. Les Pauls, Telecasters, Stratocasters, old Martin guitars, everybody wants the vintage stuff. Because at some point it got as good as it's ever going to get. And it's not going to get any better. People want those designs. Some things are just timeless. And other things, like snowmobiles, like compound bows, they're always just in this competition for that extra, extra, extra little something. We don't need that extra something 90% of the time. Your iPhone 6 is probably not a thousand bucks better than your iPhone 5. I don't even know, because I've got a $50 Android phone with uh, no data on it. Just talk and text. If there's one piece of perspective that I think has a lot of wisdom to it, it's take a look at everything in our lives and make the decision, is this good enough? Do I need to spend 40, 50 hours of my work week or two weeks of my work year to pay for this upgrade? Is it gonna benefit me? 90% of the time, the answer is no. Last year's model might be just as good as this year's model. Number six shoot for being more self-reliant. When it comes to self-reliance, you could be completely reliant, but you can hardly ever be completely self-reliant. The idea is to move the scale over towards self-reliant. Take a look at the basic aspects of life. When it comes to food, is most of your food in the freezer? Would it be better if you focus more on buying dry food or focused on growing and canning food? Stuff that if the power goes out for a week or a month, the food is going to be fine. If you're relying on a freezer full of food, do you have a generator to keep that running in the event of a long-term power outage? Look at home heating. Do you have a wood stove backup? I would suggest that you did, no matter where you're at. Wood is something that anybody can find. They can gather it themselves with an ax or with a saw. Having a wood stove, at least for a backup, at least in one building, maybe even in your garage, just so you had a heatable space in the event that you lost power and your furnace didn't work. If you live in the city to where like a utility could collapse, you know, an underground water main breaks, shuts down water for a week or so, do you have extra water on hand? Do you got bottled water stored up? If you're in the country and you have a well, do you have a backup water source? If you lose electricity, do you have a generator that you could use to run the well to fill water containers? There's always something we can do to get ready for that next thing and be more reliant on our own resources. Being prepared just makes good sense. Number five, build yourself an outhouse. I've had an outhouse for the last 20 years on every single piece of property I've owned. I could not imagine not having an outhouse. If you look in old frontier type magazines or survival type magazines, it won't take very long before you'll see this image 
of a mountain man in like a Hudson Bay blanket coat with a Kentucky long rifle, you know, looking out at the horizon. That image is the first thing a lot of people think about when they think about self-sufficiency. When I think about self-sufficiency, the first thing I think about is an outhouse. Outhouses have been around for thousands of years. They've always worked. They always will work. When your toilet doesn't work, the outhouse works. When your water doesn't work, the outhouse works. When you've got 15 people over for the holidays and the bathroom's always full, generally the outhouse isn't. A hundred years ago, indoor plumbing was a novelty, but the outhouse was everywhere. Several thousand years before this century, the outhouse was the answer. The outhouse is still the answer. The only thing you have to consider when you build an outhouse is make sure it's as far away from your water source as possible and make sure it's in good draining soil. You don't want to dig a hole and have water come up in the bottom because you're, then you're into the water table. Other than that, the outhouse has been industry standard for 5,000 years. There's no improving on it. You want to find more self-reliance in your life? It's at the bottom of an outhouse hole. So go dig one. Number four, sit around a campfire as much as you can. I'd love to be sitting around a campfire right now, and so would you. I don't know what you're doing, but I'm trying to wrap this video up. And when I'm done, I'm going to go sit by a fire. Number three, buy yourself a new hat. Just kidding. Number two, keep a record of your life. This is something that's really been on my mind for a lot of years. I never got into keeping a journal, but I'd always wonder, when did this thing happen? I can remember this, this event or whatever, this trip, and I, it's hard to place that stuff, and pretty soon, it's all just a blur. Just one huge blur. In shooting YouTube videos, I found that one of the wonderful things about it is I get to look back a couple years ago and be like, oh yeah, that's what I was doing at this point in time. Time is really, it's going by for all of us. Just having some kind of a way to make some kind of a record of what you did with your time. I think it makes time go slower and it, and it lets you look back and say, okay, this is how I spent my time. This is what I did with my time. I think if anybody took just a little bit of time to make some notes or to write a journal entry or, or shoot a little piece of video or anything, just to grab onto what we did with our time. So we have some kind of an idea later when we're thinking back about it. And my number one tip for 2020, do something radical for yourself. Maybe you'd like to quit your job and move out west. Do it this year. Maybe you'd like to go spend 30 days in the bush just living off the land to see what that's like. Go do that. Maybe you want to buy a motorcycle. Go buy a motorcycle. Doing something drastic and getting something accomplished that's always been nagging at you. What a fantastic thing to do with your time. Let me tell you a little story. Back when I was 19, 20 years old, I played in a band called Loose County Road Commission. We put out an album in 1996. We're all just kids. And we played all over the place. We had a great time. I left for Alaska in 1998. At that point, the, the band picked up a different guitar player and they played for a while and then they kind of folded up. I still see all the guys from the group. I've known them most of my life. But we had a whole album's worth of songs that we didn't record. And it drove me out of my mind. I wanted to get back with the guys and record those songs. And we talked about it year after year after year. Finally, in 2005, I finished up the concrete season in Fairbanks. I drove all the way down to Michigan, recorded this album in like a week and a half, and drove all the way back to Fairbanks. But my goodness, getting it done, it was such a weight off my shoulders. It was, it was just one of those things that you just think about and think about and think about, and it drives you mad because it's, it's unfinished business. It took a radical leap to get that done. I had to get three guys around besides myself that all had different things going. We had to set aside this block of time, and I drove nearly 10,000 miles to make that happen. But, whew, got that off my plate. Almost everybody's got something they've really wanted to do that's drastic, that's gonna take some effort, and it's gonna take some change. And I think this is a great year to get that done. For years, I wanted to start a YouTube channel because I liked watching YouTube. And I thought it would be a really interesting thing to be part of. And I actually got my camera training from being on season four of Alone on the History Channel. Before that, I had no idea how to run one of these things. And I had no idea how to run the software, the editing software to, to actually put the video out. To me, it was just a mystery. To make that leap, to invest money in, in cameras and laptops and stuff, to put this YouTube channel together, 
it, it was a bit of a leap, but I'm so glad that I did it because I had wanted to do it for years. And when I finally got to do it, I, I've had a great time ever since. I, I think this is a fantastic fit. I love sharing stuff with you guys and being able to capture different things that are, that are interesting and show them to you guys. My sister for years uh, wanted to get her pilot's license. She got her pilot's license probably four years ago. But uh, it, it took a long time to, to finally get to the point of chasing that dream down. And, and I'll bet if you ask her, she would tell you that it, it was well worth it. And it's just such a great feeling to do something kind of extreme, something that you feel like you've needed to do, to just to get something done, to, to do something that's, that's radical. That's why I like that word. So thank you guys so much for tuning in to my top 20 radical tips for 2020. My name's Dave Whipple and you've been watching Bush Radical. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and hit the little bell to get updates. And be radical, eh? We'll see you soon. Thank you.